Welcome to the first keynote lecture in the Wider Development Conference 2021. I'm Kunal Sen, the director of UNU Wider. I'm delighted to introduce the first keynote speaker. Oriana Bandiera is a Sir Anthony Atkinson Professor of Economics at the London School of Economics and a fellow of the British Academy, Economic Society, CEPR, BRED, and ESA. She's co editor of Econometrica, vice president of the European Economic Association and Director of the Gender, Growth, and Labor Markets Low-Income Countries Program. Oriana serves in the Council of the Economic Society, on the board of the International Growth Center, and as Vice President of the Collegio Carlo Alberto. Oriana's research focuses on how monetary incentives and social relationships interact to shape individual choices within organizations, how this shapes labor markets, the allocation of talent, and ultimately living standards. Her research has been awarded the ICA Young Labor Economist Prize, the Carlo Alberto Model Medal, the Esther Bosto Prize, the Yaro Johansson Award, and the Ira Award. One of the profoundly negative implications about the pandemic is that it will set back progress in reducing poverty by 20 years or more. Oriana will draw from her recent research to speak of the implications of COVID-19 for the extremely, extreme poor in low-income countries. She'll speak for about 45 minutes and we'll have 15 minutes at the end for Q&A. Please send in your questions in the Q&A feature and I will read the questions on your behalf. I now invite Oriana Bandera to provide the first keynote lecture of the conference. Oriana, over to you. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Oriana Bandera. I'm from the London School of Economics and I'm very grateful to the organizers for inviting me to give this uh, uh, keynote today. Uh, talking about COVID-19 and extreme poverty. Now, it's probably no news to you that uh, uh, for the first time in 20 years, the World Bank has uh, predicted a large increase in global poverty. And this figure makes the point very clearly. Global poverty has been falling steadily for the last 20 years. Uh, here is a very recent data from 2015 projected up to 2021, and we see that the fall in global poverty has been halted uh, because of the pandemic, in the year of the pandemic, and the projections are such that basically five years of gain in poverty reduction are going to be completely undone by the pandemic that we are experiencing in these days. Now, these are global numbers. If we look at the poorer regions of the world, and in particular Sub-Saharan Africa, where poverty was not falling before the pandemic, we actually estimate a net increase in the number of global poor living in Sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, the numbers are quite large. You see that you go from uh, an, an estimated 440 million of extreme poor to uh, almost 500 million. So where things were improving, the improvement has been stopped. Where things were not improving, the estimates suggest that poverty will get worse. Now, to some extent, this is not surprising because we are living in extraordinary economic times. Economic activity has been heavily disrupted by the pandemic. So it's rather obvious that uh, when things go bad, all the bad things get worse, and poverty is clearly one of them. But the really question of interest is whether this effect is permanent or whether it will revert once the pandemic ends. So the answer to that question depends on the structure of uh, the economic activity in uh, countries where most of the world poor live, and in particular, whether there is a mirror image of the big push phenomena, which I will call big pull. So to remind you what we know about the big push is that uh, policies that are sufficiently, that represent a sufficiently large positive shock for the poor can actually break the poverty trap and lead to a permanent reduction in poverty, 
which comes not from the fact that you give a large transfer, hence people have more to eat, but rather that large transfers enable uh, the poor to take actions which will take them out of poverty forever. And these actions can be investments in human capital that allow uh, the engagement in more remunerative occupations or investment in physical capital that likewise allow the poor to shift from bad, poorly paid jobs to better paid jobs. So fundamentally, there are two ways in which uh, people can get out of poverty because poverty is uh, tautologically not having high enough earnings. How to improve earnings? You can invest into physical capital with which to combine your labor. So for instance, a casual agricultural laborer can invest in land and uh, combine his labor with land to produce more and hence earn more. Or you can invest in human capital so that you can leave the farm and go work for, say, a firm that will, uh, um, will pay more. So to reduce poverty rather trivially, we need people to have higher earnings. To have higher earnings, you need to combine your labor with either physical or human capital. Uh, now, the question is whether the pandemic will do the opposite of these big push policies, that is, will take away physical capital from and human capital from the poor, and this will push them into poverty for the foreseeable future. Today, I will review two recent papers that uh, have bearing on this question. Uh, the first, we look at uh, human capital, and we will go back to the Ebola epidemic in Sierra Leone, and we will see how school closures uh, curtail the human capital accumulation of girls through the link uh, of teenage pregnancies. And the second, we look at physical capital, and we will uh, review the evidence on how lockdown policies affected business closures in Bangladesh. So the first paper is co-authored with a team at the World Bank and UCL in Brack. Uh, we have Nick Buren and Marcus Goldstein at the World Bank, Imran Rasul and Andreas Moura at UCL, and Mushi Sulaiman at Brack. The motivating uh, observation behind this paper is that uh, uh, the pandemic or the epidemic in this case creates the need for social distancing. Social distancing means that many public services, most notably schools and health provisions is restricted. The question that we ask in this paper is whether these policies will outlive the virus that motivated their adoption in the first place. And the main link that we have in mind is through investments in human capital, because investments in human capital are a key channel through which pandemic can have long-term impacts. Human capital investments are normally done during childhood and adolescence. So if during that time people are unable to invest in human capital, they will never recover that possibility. Uh, notice an obvious mechanical effect of closing schools on human capital because obviously if schools are closed people cannot go to school and hence cannot accumulate human capital. But the question of interest is whether once the schools reopen the accumulation starts from where it stopped or whether it's permanently shifted downwards to a lower level. The key link that we have in mind and on which we provide evidence is teenage pregnancies. So the causal chain goes from school closures, lowering the opportunity cost of time with men, uh, and an increase in the risk of pregnancy, which will materialize as childbirth from some girls and hence a drop out from school. And because uh, the effect of uh, pregnancy is permanent, that is, once you have a child, you will have a child for the rest of your life. The effect on human capital is also permanent, that is, the temporary school closure 
will actually make girls drop out in the long term. Our context is the, as I said, the Ebola epidemic in 2015 in Sierra Leone, where all schools and most health centers closed for one year. Teenage pregnancies are very common in Sub-Saharan Africa, and uh, Sierra Leone actually scores among the highest in the continent. What we see is that uh, teenage pregnancies are especially common among the poorest, in this graph, we give the average number of children ever born to mothers of different ages between 15 and 24, and the different lines represent different wealth quintiles. The black line is the poorest wealth quintile, and the pink line is the richest. And you see that there is a strong wealth gradient in which the poorer girls are more at risk of teenage pregnancies. Interestingly, schooling seems to uh, curtail the rates of teenage pregnancies. The girls who are complete secondary schools are much less likely to get pregnant. Obviously, this is just a correlation. It captures a two-way causation from schools to pregnancies and from pregnancies to schooling. But what we are interested in here is whether the, the school closures actually increase the risk of pregnancy. To answer that question, we use two key sources of variation. The first is the randomization of uh, a program run and implemented by the NGO BRAC. The program is called ILA, which stands for Empowering Livelihood of Adolescents. And what the program does is that it offers safe spaces, that is, clubs. And in these clubs, girls can uh, hang out among themselves, but also undertake training programs. And the training are of two types. There is uh, vocational training, which is a standard form of training that facilitates the transition between schools and uh, labor markets. And there is also life skill training, which contains, among others, modules on contraception and relationship with men. We combine this randomized rollout with the observational variation in health center closures. Now, the reason why this is relevant in this setting is that the health centers, in the absence of schools, which were closed because of the epidemic, the health center is really the only place in these villages where girls can go to get a safe space and to get contraceptives and training on contraceptives. So having variation in the health center uh, closures actually creates variation in the demand for the BRAC club. We randomized the allocation of the BRAC clubs across 200 villages and we follow 3,000 girls uh, age 12 to 18 over a six-year period. Now, the evaluation of the ELA program was done independently of the epidemic. As a matter of fact, when BRAC decided to implement this program in Sierra Leone, Nobody had any idea that Ebola would uh, strike so heavily. And uh, we indeed completed our baseline survey entirely by chance a couple of weeks before the first case of Ebola was found in Sierra Leone. So we are in an ideal position because we have uh, very rich data on time use, whether girls devote time to studying, working, or relationships with men, a baseline before the Ebola strikes. And then again, at the end of the Ebola reducing measures, so when schools reopen in uh, 2016. So we are in an ideal position, albeit totally by chance, to study the effect of Ebola on schooling and pregnancies as well as the effect of safe spaces in, uh, on that relationship.
So to begin with, we show the strong correlation between Ebola, pregnancies and dropouts. These data come entirely from control villages, that is villages in which there is no club operating. And we see that in these villages, the enrollment in school drops for every age. So the first figure here on the top left hand side panel shows that girls aged between 12 and 18 are less likely to be in school at every age. So if you look for instance at 13 years old, uh, before the epidemic, 90% of them were in school, after the epidemic is 70%, and so on. Of course, enrollment fall with age, but for every age, the maroon bars, which are after the epidemic, are lower than the blue bars, which are before the epidemic. Now, interestingly, for our purposes, pregnancy becomes the main reason for not attending school. Uh, here, again, the blue bars are the reasons before the epidemic, and the maroon bars are the reasons after. Before the epidemic, 50% of girls uh, mentioned financial costs as the key reason for why they were not going to school, but after the epidemic, is 40% the most common reason becomes pregnancy. And there is a strong correlation between attending school and being pregnant. 85% of girls who get pregnant do not return to school. We can see here, there's only 3% of those who get pregnant who return to school. And 73% of those who do not get pregnant return to school. There was also a policy in Sierra Leone that prevented visibly pregnant girls from attending schools. So there is a mechanical effect of this but the, the fact that girls did not go back to school because this is two years later, so the children would have been born by then, uh, re suggests that pregnancies which happened during the Ebola epidemic actually reduced the uh, schooling of girls permanently. Now, our key source of variation as I said, is uh, two. We have variation in the availability of health centers at the village level and variation in the availability of safe spaces through ELA. The reason why we need the first source of variation is because it gives us variation in the exposure, the risk to pregnancy. Because where health centers are closed, girls have essentially nowhere to go. So these regressions again are run in control villages where there are no ELA clubs, and we see that the time devoted to learning is lower when the health center is closed, and the time devoted to socializing, especially with men, is much higher. Uh, this also corresponds to an increase in the frequency of unprotected sex, and the outcome of unprotected sex inevitably is pregnancy. Now, the question of interest is whether there is demand for ELA clubs in these uh, villages where the health center is closed as a substitute for safe spaces, and whether these ELA clubs are effective at preventing pregnancies. And that's indeed what we find. The demand for clubs is much higher in villages with no health center or with the health center closed. We see here that where the health center is open, we have 64% of girls attending. Where the health center is closed, that percentage go up to 76%. And more interestingly, it is the high ability girls who are more likely to attend where the health center is closed. So this difference, this 12 percentage point difference here, comes mostly from high ability girls we measure ability a baseline using Raven matrices. We see that the high ability girls are more likely to want it to attend life skill training courses, that is the courses that teach them how not to get pregnant essentially, and less interested in the vocational training courses, that is the courses that teach you how to do a job. 
uh, this is in line with the fact that there are two reasons to attend the bra clubs. One is to protect yourself from men and essentially to find a place to be safe until schools reopen so that you can go back to school once that happens. And the second reason is to learn a trade and start working. It's not surprising then that the higher ability girls seem to be interested in the former and the lower ability girls are more interested in the latter. And because uh, um, in some villages there is no substitute for, um, for schooling in terms of safe spaces because the health center is closed, that's precisely the villages in which the high ability girls are more likely to attend the ELA clubs. So now the question is whether these ELA clubs are effective at protecting the girls from pregnancies. And we find that indeed the ELA clubs undo the effect of closures. Uh, these graphs uh, report all the outcomes. This, the first on the top left hand side corner here is time use. So it's time devoted to learning, to work, uh, to social, uh, to household chores and socializing. And uh, the gray bars are the estimates that we already saw. That is the effect of uh, health centers closures on, uh, um, on these outcomes in controlled villages. And the green bars is the interaction between that effect and the presence of vanilla club. So the fact that, for instance, this gray bar here is negative on time devoted to learning is what we saw earlier, that girls in control villages where the health center closed are less likely to spend time learning. And the fact that the green bar is positive suggests so that this effect is undone by the presence of the ill club. So we see that everywhere here, the green and the gray bar go in the opposite direction. That is, closing the health center makes girls less likely to go to school. Having ELA makes them more likely to go to school. Uh, importantly, this suspension of schooling results in a true loss of human capital. This graph here on the uh, top right hand side measures the effect on skills in literacy and math and we see that there is a grand a strong depreciation of the skills um, in uh, villages where the health center closed which is undone by the availability of ELA clubs. The same thing happens with pregnancies is a strong increase in pregnancies where the health center is closed which is undone by the ELA club. As we follow girls for another two years after, so 19, uh, 2019 and 2020, we can measure the persistence of the effects. And we find that the effects are persistent in the sense that girls who were induced by the program to spend less time with men, four years down the line, they're less likely to have children, they're more likely to still be in school and to have higher human capital. So in conclusions, um, our results in the analysis of uh, uh, the link between human capital, pregnancies and schooling in uh, Sierra Leone suggest that uh, there is indeed a concern, there is evidence that supports the concern that uh, the measures which are taken to limit the spread of viruses hit young women the hardest and for the longer time because uh, it, only girls of course are at risk of getting pregnant and uh, so this creates a gap, another gender gap which adds up to the um, to the existing gaps. Uh, beyond obvious equity concerns, efficiency is also at stake because the human capital of half a generation drops in a permanent way 
And this is also true for the most talented. We saw that it's precisely girls of the highest ability who are attracted to the club uh, when the school and the health centers are closed because they want to be protected and uh, uh, restart school when these reopen. So safe spaces are a cheap and a effective solution because there's clearly demand for them, but of course they have to be provided to be effective. And it's not clear in the uh, context of the current pandemic the extent to which girls have a place where they can protect themselves until the schools open again. So there is the real, very real risk that the talent of uh, millions of girls in low-income countries will never be put to its best use because pregnancies will essentially reduce the human capital accumulation for the rest of their lives. This has implications at the micro level for their own uh, well-being and poverty and at the macro level for the growth of their countries who will have to do without their talent. The second example that I'm going to discuss today has to do with physical capital. So, um, as a reminder, the original setup was that one in which uh, we said that poverty is essentially due to low earnings and uh, the way of increasing earnings is either by combining labor with uh, human capital, which we have reviewed in the case of Sierra Leone, or with physical capital that is start to accumulate assets with which to run a business. Uh, it's the second of these uh, two types of ways to increase earnings that will be the key uh, focus of this paper. Uh, this paper is joined with Robin Burgess at the LFC, Atiyah Rahman and Imran Mateen Abrak. So the paper relies on a rapid survey that Brack quickly put on the field as soon as the first lockdown started in Bangladesh. And uh, this is a survey about jobs. So he asks 7,000 households about the main source of earnings. And he does so uh, twice at the start of lockdown in April 2020 and after the end of the lockdown in June 2020. And in both cases, he asks retrospectively questions about uh, jobs and the livelihoods before the pandemic in February 2020. The samples are drawn from nationally representative surveys and they are 50% urban and 50% rural. Now, if we look at jobs across the world, we see that a distinctive feature of development is that there is a large increase in salary jobs. In low-income settings, people are less likely to have salary jobs and more likely to be in either self-employment, running a small business, or casual labor, that is, selling their labor daily without any contract or guarantee of further employment. Now, the prevalence of these three types of jobs within country also relates to wealth. So in the poorest countries, we see more casual jobs and less salary jobs. And within a given country, we see more casual jobs among the poor and more salary jobs among the rich. So salaried employment is rare. We see here that only 25% of our sample has uh, uh, salaried employment, but the percentage goes up by a good 10 percentage point for the richest people. In this graph, we have the share of people in each wealth bin who do these three forms of jobs. So if you start from the lowest wealth bin, you see that 40% of people are engaged in casual jobs, about 26% are engaged in small businesses, and 25% are engaged in salary jobs. Once you go to the other end of the spectrum, to the richest wealth bins, you see that the, um, the patterns, the proportions are basically flipped. 35% of people are in salary jobs and only 25% of them are in casual jobs. Okay. 
So the question is, how does the job that you have to start with uh, change? How does the earnings, uh, the earnings loss due to the pandemic change depending on the job that you had a baseline and uh, how does the pandemic actually affect the choice of jobs. So the following graph uh, represents the coefficient of a regression of the income change between February and April. And we see that by job type baseline. And we see that the owners of small business and casual laborers lose the most. They lose about 50% of their income, whereas salaried workers uh, lose about 30%. So everybody loses a fair amount, but salaried workers are more protected. So the amount of loss in earnings is larger for the jobs that are normally done by the poor. Now, what's more interesting is that the pandemic itself changes the occupational choice. So these are transition graphs that show for each occupational baseline what the person does uh, in June. So this is the change in occupation from the beginning of the pandemic till the end of the first lockdown. So in these four months between February and June, there's uh, a considerable churning so if you start from business here at the bottom, there's only 60% of people who had a business in February, they still have it in June, and 30% instead move on to casual labor. Likewise, 74% of people who had a salaried job in February still have it in June, and 30% move on to casual labor. Now, the question of interest to understand whether these transitions are permanent or they're just dictated by a standard efficiency argument that the best businesses survive and the worst businesses close depends on whether the transitions are driven by the earnings in the occupation or wealth. So the next graph reports the average earnings of uh, people who stay in the same occupations and those who leave. For business, we see that it is the, those who earn the most who are more likely to stay, and those who earn the least are more likely to close down. However, when it comes to casual labor, we see that it is those who earn the least who are more likely to stay, and those who earn the most are more likely to transition into salaried labor. Now, so it's not really a comparative advantage story because otherwise we would have seen that the highest earners would have remained in their existing occupation. So not surprisingly, what's going on, the true driver of these changes is wealth. So what we report in this graph is the baseline wealth of uh, people who stay in their job so these are the thick lines here, and people who leave. And you see here that it is the richest business owners who manage to hold on to their business while the poorest move to casual labor. And once you look at casual labor, you see exactly the opposite. It is the poorest casual workers who keep their casual jobs while the richest move on to salaried labor. In other words, we can visualize this result as an earnings wealth frontier for those who live. So if you draw the relationship between wealth and earnings of the businesses which close down, you see that for a given level of profit, so these are the maximum earnings, the probability of survival depends on the wealth. Or in other words, wealthier business owners are more likely to be able to keep their business open for any level of profits. 
That means that profitable businesses of poor owners are more likely to close than equally profitable businesses of wealthy owners. The same thing applies to entry. So, uh, you know, as businesses close, new businesses are created and the level of earnings that you need to create a business if you're poor is much higher than the level of earnings that you need to create the business if you're rich. So what's going on here is that effectively good businesses of poor owners are being replaced by uh, less profitable businesses by rich owners. So this is a loss both for the individuals because of course um, a capable but poor owner is less likely to be able to hold on to his business and moves into casual labor but it is also importantly a loss to society because the talent of poor owners is not put to its best use. So what we learn from the experience of COVID in Bangladesh is that the effect of COVID depends on the type of job. Casual laborers and business owners are hit the hardest. So this leads people to change jobs, but the ability to change jobs, that is to move towards a safer job, which is salaried employment, varies with wealth. It's only wealthier people who get into better jobs. This leads to inequality, because again, it's the wealthier people that can get the better jobs, and importantly, misallocation, because talented poor people who would be better at business uh, tend not to be able to do so. And again, gives us a reason for why the effect of the pandemic will last longer than the pandemic itself, because the poor owner who has lost his business will find it much harder to restart the business once the pandemic stops. So the final answer to the question that motivated this talk and with which I started the talk, remember was, is there such a thing as a big pool? And is COVID a, a shock which is sufficiently negative to pull uh, people back into a poverty trap, hence have a persistent effect on the level of poverty? Unfortunately, the answer to this question seems to be yes, that is, there is a real danger that the effect of the pandemic on poverty will outlive the pandemic itself. And this is because the um, accumulation of capital, both human and physical capital that's needed for people to combine their labor and uh, derive higher earnings, therefore exiting poverty, is actually curtailed by the policies which have been implemented to contain the spread of the virus. This means that you know, if no action is taken, so if no protection is given to girls for them not to get pregnant and drop out of school, if no sustainment is given to wealthier, less wealthy business owners who have good ideas but not enough wealth to keep their restaurants, their um, their hair salons, their motor mechanic businesses open, then we will wake up after the pandemic in a world that's much more unequal and importantly much poorer. Because uh, a fact that is often overlooked once we look at poverty estimates is that poverty is not just the business of the poor, but it is fundamentally the determinant of well-being in countries as a whole. Uh, Oriana, thank you so much for your presentation. It was very interesting. Um, there are a couple of questions already in the chat and I would encourage the audience to ask more questions. So you want an interactive Q&A session. But I had one question on the Ebola paper and then one the Bangladesh paper, which I might just uh, keep aside for some time. On the Ebola paper, there's a question I have is on external validity. 
So the Ebola pandemic was different perhaps from the coronavirus pandemic because in the coronavirus pandemic, we had initially national lockdowns, but then we had started having local lockdowns as countries started having more targeted approaches. The local lockdowns happened mostly in urban centers because that's where the transmission was the most. And so my question then is that the finding that you have on early pregnancy and school dropout that you see in the Ebola crisis, how much can we say that might happen with the coronavirus uh, 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 pandemic? Do you think that you could extrapolate from those results for, uh, for the current, for the COVID-19 pandemic? Uh, I think you're muted. <laughs> I've been doing this for two years now and I still forget. <laughs> uh, so, thank you so much for the question. Um, so I think that the results apply to any crisis that lead to school closures. Because the mechanism here is the lowering of the opportunity cost of time and the lack of a safe space. So to the extent that uh, uh, countries respond to the coronavirus by closing schools, this mechanism will be at play. It's, uh, the generalizability relies on the closure of schools because that's the mechanism that we show. Thank you. Uh, now two questions specifically on your paper and two questions which are related. So let me ask them together, if that's okay. The first sure. question is from my colleague, Sam Jones, uh, who's based in Maputo. So Sam asks, could you clarify the cost of the safe space intervention per beneficiary, and do you think it can be realistically scaled up? Let me ask the second question, that's okay. Uh, the second question from Sarah Sison Yana, and she says, this is a very interesting presentation, what do we need to do differently to ensure that the girls, re the girls receive timely protection from early pregnancies during such pandemics? How can government scale up the BRAC model? So the basic question is about scaling up. Do you want to answer this two question? Thank you. Of course. So the BRAC program has many components. It has the component of the safe space, which is just the space that BRAC rents in the communities, and the space leader, who's a girl the same age, who gets trained by BRAC to run the club. Then it has a livelihood training component, which is the equivalent of vocational training. And it has a life skill component, which is advice on especially relationships with men and contraception. You also can have a financial skills and microfinance component. So the cost, so the reason why I'm giving all these details is that the main effect uh, in this case is that of the safe space. So the safe space alone is rather cheap. We evaluated the ILA program in Uganda and there, the cost of the old program was $30 per girl per year. If we remove the vocational training component, which is, of course, important to hide the transition into the labor market, but is not so important for the safe space feature of the club, then the cost is $15 per girl per year. So I think it's worth it but then again it depends on how much value you put on the teenage pregnancies and the human capital accumulation that's curtailed for these girls sure thank you very much uh, oriana i have now a, another kind of generic question from the audience the question is uh, and i'll now add my question also because it's about the bangladesh paper so the question that comes to the audience is that it's evident the workers in the informal sector suffered the most in the pandemic, which you showed in the, very clearly in the Bangladesh uh, paper. What measures can we employ to prevent this in future? But let me add my specific question here, which is a bit more on the mechanisms. Now, one of the things that's unusual about this pandemic, especially in Bangladesh, is microfinance institutions closed down or any kind of formal borrowing closed down. And that was mostly for those who are in lower income strata. So as you know, in Bangladesh, most people who are low income, uh, self employed for example, tend to borrow from microfinance institutions. And even, even things like borrowing from friends and family was not possible because you couldn't move around. So uh, so how does, so is that a mechanism that might explain your result? That for that reason, because of this very specific nature of the pandemic closing down microfinance institutions and informal lending, that might affect more the fact that those who are in the lower income strata could not get the credit they wanted to carry on, while the wealthier uh, businesses obviously had their own funds. And so again, two questions here. One is for informal workers, what can we do about them? Take so this specific mechanism that we see 
might observe in your paper, on the Bangladesh paper. Thanks. Of course. So uh, there is no doubt that uh, informality and casual labor is uh, really the symptom of extreme poverty. So it's not just in the context of the pandemic, but in general, if we want to reduce poverty, we need to create better jobs. In the meantime, one thing that can be done is to coordinate, to create mechanisms that coordinate the informal workers. Because fundamentally, the, the problem with casual labor is that the landlord, which hires these people, has all the power. And, uh, you know, might these be agricultural workers or urban transport workers, each in isolation, don't have any protection. If they were in a formal contract, they would have the protection of the law. So there is not being thought, but it should be uh, thought to organize the informal workers in a way that gives them a collective voice towards the, the employer. Um, regarding the, the lending, of course, that doesn't make things any better because we're all in the same boat. So if before you could borrow from your family and friends, now your family and friends are also affected by the crisis. So borrowing has gone down and that hurts the most people with the lowest wealth. Uh, in terms of microfinance uh, in Bangladesh, I don't know if uh, the poorest of the poor, that is those who have no business, can actually benefit much from microfinance because the repayments are so rapid that they don't have time to start a business. But for sure, the business owners with lower wealth must have suffered from the lack of credit. Right. Thank saw, you. Yeah. yeah. No, go ahead. No, no. We saw in the data that precisely the relationship between wealth and closure of business was very strong during the pandemic. Hmm. I mean, there's, a, you know, there's been a discussion about uh, uh, social protection schemes in Bangladesh and elsewhere. I mean, do you think this is the moment now for really having a much more accessible and a, perhaps a universal social protection? Because clearly targeting has become more of a problem. As you showed, there are salaried workers who are moving into casual worker, casual labor, for example. So, you know, who should you target? So do you think there's an argument for that uh, uh, across, across the board? Maybe not only for Bangladesh, but other developing countries? Absolutely. So one result which I didn't show is that uh, among, we have data on uh, whether uh, people receive social protection and it's all for the salaried workers. And that's why we see even the richest casual workers, for instance, could have been casual tutors. You know, casual workers don't need to be all low skills, all move into salaried employment because salaried employment is what provides the most protection. So in a way, because we can only protect the formal sector, we end up protecting those who need it the least, so to speak. Uh, that links to what I was arguing before about coordinating informal workers and targeting social protection to them as well. So the social protection is not tied to the employer, but rather is tied to the person. So you think that's the way to go? Yes. Yeah. And, and do you see any evidence of that as yet in the policy discussions? Um, not, not as much other than uh, uh, for universal credit. But uh, we have done some work in documenting. So the World Bank has a, a very uh, detailed database on social protection programs all around the world. And uh, you can see very clearly that uh, um, the countries, the poorer the countries, the worse the targeting, essentially. Right, thank you. I have now two very specific questions from uh, a member of the audience, Jacqueline Velasco, one on the Ebola paper, the other on the, on the Bangladesh paper. On the Ebola paper, she's asking the marital status of the girls who, uh, who became pregnant. I mean, do you have a sense about are they, were they married or not married? And does it, does it really matter? Most of them were not. And what we find is that uh, six years down the line, when we go back in 2020, actually the program has affected the type of uh, person that the girl married. So girls who were protected by the club end up marrying men who are more educated, 
who are closer to them in age and who are more averse to gender-based violence. So there is, uh, most of the girls are not married during the intervention, but they get married later. And the intervention seems to have this effect on the quality of the men that they marry. That's really interesting. That's very uh, quite remarkable, really. Uh, let me again uh, now ask a uh, specific question from Jacqueline on uh, your Bangladesh papers. She, she asked the question, how does the issue of productivity enter into explaining the different trajectories of the earning wealth frontier? So how does productivity play a part in explaining the, the relationship between showed in earnings and wealth? So to the extent that earnings reflect productivity, then what we have is that the most productive but poor uh, business owners close down. So that, you know, basically wealth buys you some productivity, so to speak, for survival. So if uh, for a given productivity, the wealthier owner is more likely to survive, which means that for a given level of wealth, uh, you get more productive owners surviving. So productive and poor are less likely to survive than non-productive and rich. Right. I mean, there is a very nice set of papers by Mushfiq Mubarak and co-authors on uh, migrants in Bangladesh, especially as you know, Bangladesh has a lot of migrants overseas. Many of them had to come back uh, when there was lockdowns in Malaysia, UAE and so on. And revenues are very important for self-employment, right? I mean, they use is as, as a seed capital to get started. Now, I don't, I mean, obviously in a paper that's difficult to bring in because you haven't looked at that, but I'm speculating on what exactly do you see the, the role of the problem of migration or rather remittances being a mechanism which uh, for financing self-employment, uh, especially for not the poorest, but the, those on the lower income strata uh, that was sh totally shut down during the pandemic. And this is not only true for Bangladesh, but many other countries which are also receive a lot of remittances. So this links very well to your earlier question on microfinance, because remittances are another source of funding, which are actually even more important than credit because they don't have to be repaid most of the time. So that's a very important source of financing that's been cut down for everybody. And contrary to microfinance, which only affects the people that could have benefited from microfinance beforehand, remittances affect everybody. So no doubt there is the, the drying up of the funds. And in addition, there is the returning migrant who's one more mouth to feed. I think it shows, you know, when we think about lockdowns, we should be careful. We only think of lockdowns in a specific country in question. But lockdowns in some other country where we have migrants from that country uh, can also, as we saw in the case of Bangladesh, have huge effects in the, in the, in the source country. So that's something Absolutely. we need to keep in mind, the spillover effects of when you have lockdowns across the board in many other countries, how that can affect the country that's sending the labor. And that's something I think uh, perhaps one needs to think a bit more about. Now, there is a question here that may well be the, you know, could be the last question because it's a kind of very uh, broad brush question. The question is that considering the long reach and drawn out effect of the pandemic um, on an effect on the on pandemic, on po poverty and inequality, what probable actions are required to mitigate these negative outcomes? So looking ahead to the future, I mean, that's quite difficult perhaps, but if you uh, wanted to just say, how do you think we could try to take particular action steps? You talked a little bit about social protection, of course, in mitigating the negative effects on poverty and, and inequality, if, it, if that is possible, obviously, given the situation at hand. No, absolutely. I, I think we're kind of sleepwalking into disaster because, uh, by not taking into account the long-term effect of a rapid increase in inequality and poverty, we will find out once eventually this will end that the problem will be much harder to solve because the longer people are left in poverty, the more the drain on the few resources that they have, the most expensive is gonna be to pull them out. I think on the positive side, I think that all the results we have from programs that have tried to create better jobs is that uh, the problem is not intrinsically that the people are unable or unwilling to do productive jobs that earn a decent salary, which keeps them out of poverty, is that these jobs are not available. 
So I think that uh, any policies that uh, maintains, you know, social protection for bad times, which is the times that we're living now, but looking in the future, policies that help infrastructure, that helps businesses create jobs, is going to be fundamental. Mm -hmm. Training programs, you know, for all the workers that have not been able to train so far. So we're now involved in a large scale training evaluation uh, in Bangladesh with BRAC. And there is huge demand for training. But of course, given the positive funding, people cannot afford it. So funding training or even giving loans for workers to be trained is going to be um, a very important step in this. And so that's on physical capital. What about on human capital? What can one do on human capital? Because as you as you obviously saw your, your Ebola paper, there's significant scarring of human capital, especially for girls. What can do about human capital? So training is more on the human capital side, but that the human capital problem is actually not just a low income country problem. It's a problem everywhere mm -hmm. because the pandemic has interrupted the accumulation of human capital among low socioeconomic status children everywhere. So there's no doubt that uh, we need to take remedial action now. And it's very, very cheap to provide human capital for children. But if we don't do it now, fixing it later will be much more expensive. Mm -hmm. So especially children at the primary levels, primary yes. schooling level, right? Primary That's schools. where the skills are developed the most. Absolutely. So, yeah, absolutely. There's a very specific question here, uh, and I think we still have three minutes here, that sure. comes from Annie Boyrod, who's asking, and this is about the serial loan paper again, how would the men's or husband's attitudes to a gender-based uh, violence measured? Were the men involved in the research as well? Very specific so, question. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So actually, in the, in the first two rounds of data collection, we only interviewed girls. And uh, in the last round, in the 1920 round, once girls were forming stable partnerships, we thought it'd be important to interview the men as well. And so we did. So we interviewed both the girls and their partners. And so the gender-based violence measures are uh, collected in interviews with the partner. Right. Thank you very much. Uh, that's a very clear answer. Um, I'm going to stop here because I, you know, we are in a situation where the online conference is where we need to move to the next session in a couple of minutes. Uh, and the four parallel session is going to start at in two minutes' time. So do make sure that you get to the one that you want. Aurelia, right, thank you so much for a very clear presentation, very two very fascinating papers, and also for an excellent uh, Q&A session. We, I think it was really very, very insightful and looking forward to having you again, engaging with you and Yuvaja in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me and thank you for the questions. Thanks.